today, turn to the book of John, to the Gospel of St. John. We're going to begin in verse chapter 10, I should say. We uh, ended, ended a series last week talking about why I serve. We registered over 51 people that came down to sign up to serve. And praise the Lord, yeah, you guys. And then had our Wednesday night get in the game uh, tailgate party. Had about 200 folks here, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And, and I just praise the Lord for all the hard work and our volunteers and those that serve God with a willful heart. It's just been a great, great time. We're going to start today a series entitled Jesus Is. We're going to begin to unpack Jesus' own self-declarations. If we really want to know who Jesus is, the best person to go to, right, is Jesus. What did he say about himself? We see that all through the Word of God as God declares different types of words for different seasons and different scenarios. In fact, the Bible records 300 times the I am comment. We see it first, of course, in Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, I believe it is, where Jesus said, God says, I am, to Abraham. We see it finally in the final chapter in the Bible, the book of Revelation, as the, the Savior, the, the bride is revealed through the bridegroom. In chapter 22 and verse 16, five verses before the end of the book, and we see once again the I am statement. When Moses was on the mountain, and he asked God, who shall I say sent me to go to Pharaoh? Remember what he said? He said, I am that I am. You can understand the, the declaration there through God's sovereignty, and of course through Jesus in the time of his earthly ministry, of where we get this term that God is the great I am. That he is all things to all people at all times. That he's self-sustaining. He's self-sufficient. He is creator God. He is sustainer God. He's the goal of all things. He is the great I am. In John's gospel, we see the account of seven specific I am statements. Of course, if you're a student of God's words, you also know that there's seven signs in John's gospel. John's gospel is uniquely different than the other three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that it contains unique information from the other Gospels. doesn't in any way contradict, but kind of just beautifies the whole story in the way that John deals with the majesty of God and his kingship. We see seven I Am statements, again, as his own words declaring, professing who he is to his own people. And why that matters to us today is because one of the greatest attributes of God is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That what he was to them then, he is still today, and he is still tomorrow. I want to begin to unpack one of those I am's today, and I'm taking them out of order. If you're one of those people that has to be in chronological order, I'm going to mess you up really bad in your study. But it's, it's like ragu, right? It's in there. It's all good. Just, just follow me. The I am statement that we're going to be covering today that I believe to be absolutely perfect in timing that God had picked a few weeks ago for me to launch with is Jesus professing, I am the door. I am the door. By way of introduction, I want you to consider, if you will, the doors that you may have walked through in your life. The many doors that offered a threshold into a new career perhaps into a new relationship, perhaps even on the, on the negative side of things, doors that were open into your own lustful desires, perhaps even at the expense of others. I want you to consider today the doors that have been slammed in your face, that in that moment felt like the worst possible scenario, yet today if you look back, you can praise the Lord for the door that was closed. Can I get a witness? Anybody can just praise the Lord for a door that was closed. You know, Pastor David, I, we talked about a year ago uh, around this same time, and we, we, we felt God impressing and nudging upon us that we would not be doing Rush Weekend this year after 15 years, and we didn't know. I felt like God had, had closed a door on a chapter of my life that had often defined me, if I'm very, very honest with you, that even in doing ministry, we can be ill-defined by something that is good and something that may be God-ordained. But guess what? If that alone defines us, we have misappropriated that thing. 
Very interesting that we have to, as we race towards that calling, that we're to lay aside every sin and, and every weight that does so easily beset us. Can I tell you, there's some good things in our life that can entangle us. Does it have to just be a sin? There's a lot of good things, but can I say it this way? There's a lot of things that aren't God things. And as I begin to kind of almost weep over this prospect of not doing rush, now I see God opening a door and saying, see there, see there. If you were doing rush in the first weekend of May, you would have expelled all of this funding, and I knew what was coming before you ever knew. God had a plan. God has a season for our life. I want you to consider the doors that have been opened along the way, perhaps by friends, families. But I want you to mostly consider the door today that you walked through that brought you to this moment with the person that you're with and the church in which you sit, condition of your own heart, the financial position that you're in, the spiritual lifeness in your own heart or lack thereof, that God brought us all to this day through different doors, different shapes, all bringing us to hear this message that Jesus is the door. John's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going to unpack this thing for you today. Then Jesus said to them again, of course, them, he's speaking to the Pharisee, as you'll see in the further of my message, but I want to help you to understand the context, speaking to the Pharisee, the righteous crowd, the religious crowd, if I may. And he's told them, he said, most assuredly, I say to you that I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Then he reiterates, for I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Amen? And in addition, if there's any greater thing, right, salvation, you say, Mark, isn't salvation enough? It is absolutely enough. If he never did another thing for you and I, that in itself is sufficient. However, when he saved me, he did not instantly take me to glory. He did not instantly remove you from this world. Why? Because there's more. There's something beyond the, the threshold of the door. Salvation is what I get when I cross into him in that moment. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things are being made new. When I cross the threshold, I enter into salvation. But watch this. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And, like, watch this, he will go in and out and he will find pasture the thief however does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy the th enemy satan's modus operandi his main focus his mantra his mandate is to kill to steal and to destroy but jesus says but i have come and i want you to hang your hat here today this is what we're going to hang our hat that the door brings us to this point of reference that he says, but I have come that you may have life. Everybody said life. But that you may have it more abundantly. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name which is above all names, the only name under heaven by which we must be saved, the matchless name of Jesus, we pray today that you would help me to rightly divide this word with truth and with power. That you would forever change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen. I want to very briefly give you today three distinct points that we can glean, that we can learn from Jesus' own self-declaration as the door. Number one, I believe today that that evidence in the Scripture is that the, the door itself, Jesus, offers us passage a rite of passage. The text says, I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved. There's an if condition that is followed by your will to enter or not enter. 
But the passage has been made. Jesus came to this earth, this dirty, nasty earth. He stepped out of glory, out of timelessness, where he transcends time, entered time, entered the nasty, dirty of humanity, was born in a manger, lived a perfect, sinless life. At age 30, entered into his ministry. He was tempted and always by the enemy, yet he did not sin. He, he healed the lepers. He raised the dead. He did all the things that the Bible said he would do before he came. He did them. He hung on a tree, cursed is the man who would be hung on a tree taking the sin of mankind yours and mine and every person who's ever lived, moved, or breathed upon himself. He didn't just die for your sin. He died as it. Then three days later he got up defeating the very thing he died as. Sin, death, hell, and the grave. Today he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. He offers passage that speaks to our freedom. That there's a freedom that we can know in Christ that, watch this, that transcends even being in prison. I know to people today who have encountered the person of Jesus Christ in prison. In all aspects of the word, they are anything but free. Yet, can I say to you today that I have met people in prison. I have met people on death row. I have spoken to a man who his death was imminent, yet he was more free in Christ than some people I see walk in the streets today. Because there's a freedom through that passage. I love the fact, too, that there's also provision through that passage. That there's more than salvation. That there's relationship. That, that, that Jesus, watch this, has taken forethought for everything that would come into our life. Hey, maybe, maybe if we want to be uh, politically correct, we could engage ourselves in conversations of, of who did this, who didn't do that. Well, should we have had an antiviral? Should we? Can I tell you something? That's exactly what the enemy would have you to do is get busy debating things that do not matter in eternity. What matters in eternity is this may be the millisecond of the moment where we have an ear of a man, woman, boy, or girl that we did not have before this came into, scene, into the scene. He's made provision. Can I tell you what that provision is? The provision for the world is the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus. It's you, the church. We are a part of the provision. We're to gather in this place not to be tickled with our ears, not to be told what we want to hear, but to be told what the Bible tells us we need to be told so that we will be, watch this, stirred up and provoked that we may go out into good works. The Bible tells us that, to provoke one another. You can almost picture it. How many of y'all had that little sibling that just constantly poked at that, at that one little nerve that just made you want to hurt a brother? See, if I was really on my A-game today, I'd say, how many of y'all have that, that spouse that just knows that one button, button to, but I'm not going there. I'm not going there today. Pollen is in the air. I'll leave it alone. And can I just, can I just interject this? Everybody that coughs is not contaminated with the coronavirus. Did y'all see the cloud of pollen today? However, sneeze on a brother and I'll break your legs. <laughs> sneeze it here. Put it here. Put it here. It's good to laugh, church. The Bible says a merry heart does good like a medicine. But a broken spirit will dry your bones. You got to laugh. You got to encourage yourself. It speaks of freedom and it speaks of provision of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. A shepherd who will lay down his life and has laid down his life for his own. In Revelation, the final book revealed, one that people are afraid of because of all the allegory and all of the, the symbolic language that is used. But yet, interestingly, the only book in the entire Bible of 66 books where he says, if you read this book, you shall be blessed. Listen to what he says in Revelation. We see the final mentions of a door as he writes his letter to seven churches. That's why I'm telling you this. Seven churches 
throughout Asia. Seven literal churches, but also conditions of churches today. Cross-sections, if you will, of conditions of hearts today. So literal church, states of church, but also conditions of individual people, the temple of Jesus Christ. In which case he writes to the church at Philadelphia, the only of the seven faithful churches. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, as we talk about the door offering us passage, listen to what he says. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is, he is true, he who has the key of David. We'll stop right there for just a moment to say two things about that, because there's a lot of, of language that comes out of that, and it's very simple. It speaks of authority that you have by being in Christ. That you have an authority. You see, see, to my home, my son has a key to my home. If, if I choose to, to give a key to, to Tim Knight, then it's been done on my authority. And if I give him that, he has right of passage into my home. You see, we have been given the key of David speaks of the authority and also the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that Jesus Christ would come from the root of David, a man after God's own heart. And may I add, a man who was flawed in many, many ways, a man who had failed God, yet God does not need perfect people to bring forth his promise. He just needs people who are willing to say yes. And he says this, he who holds the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works, and I love this. See, look, behold, I have set before you, watch this, an open door, an invitation, and no one can shut it. If you're wondering today what you're going to do in the condition of your heart, in the condition of our economy, in the condition of all this, listen to what he says. For you have little strength, but you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. And because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of testing or trial, which will come upon the whole world to, tw to test those who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast. Look to your neighbor and say, hold on. Hold fast to what you have that no one takes your crown. I want you to just fixate for just a moment on this phrase where he says, I will keep you from the hour of testing, of trial, of tribulation that shall befall this earth. It's a promise from God. I can prove to you in the days of Noah. I can prove to you in the time of Sodom a, a lot. I can prove to you today that, listen, before God pours his final judgment upon this earth, you and I, that which with which restraineth, which is the Holy Spirit living in us, we will be called up to be with him in the clouds. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and following. You will not be here. Do not think, as a lot of people are trying to date set and say, this is, let me tell you, no man knows the hour nor the day. You know what that means? Not only do we not know when Jesus is coming back and the hour of testing would come upon the earth, but we don't need to know. What we need to know is today I have life. Today I have possibilities. Today I have my family. Today I have my church today is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it I'm not driven by fear Mark are you ever afraid yes I'm afraid but I have to take that thought into captivity I have to bring it under the submission of God's word where he says I've not given you the spirit of fear but of power and love and of a sound mind and I stand on that today. And, and when I do get fearful, check it out. When I do get afraid, I have to speak that over my own life. Can I tell you something? I have to convince me of that word every single day. Because in my flesh, if left alone, I will gravitate to a lie. If in my flesh and left alone, I will gravitate to fear and, and, and panic. But in Christ and standing on the word of God's promises, watch this. I will turn that, 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 that panic into a patience in him, into a peace. I will turn that fear into a faith, into a finality of knowing that he holds the very world that he created. He spoke the first word, let there be, and he will speak the last one, even though come Lord Jesus. 1918, they went through the same thing. 
And I won't say anything about that pandemic other than this. It's very interesting. I didn't know this. That the word flu, for example, comes from an Italian word, influenza. That literally means the influence. 1918, before antiviral medication, before antibiotics, before they even knew anything about this stuff, Cody, there were professionals in the world, and I use that loosely, doctors who literally met, and all these people were dying around them, and they said, it must be the misalignment of the planets. That there's an outside influence. Some said aliens. Some said seismic activity, volcanoes, and eruptions, and things out in the sea. Because if the moon can control the, the very tides, then maybe there's some outside influence. There is. His name is Jesus. And I tell you that today because I want to ask you one simple question. What is influencing your life today? Is it this virus that we know nothing about, or is it the person of Jesus that he has declared and revealed everything about himself that we need to know? Where do you put your trust? Where do you put your faith? What is your influence? I don't want to say, this will pass. This will pass. And Lord willing, if I come through it on the other side, I don't want to be sitting in my home recollecting to my grandchildren. Well, gee, what did you do of the pandemic in 2020? And my answer to them is that, well, you know what? I watched a whole bunch of Netflix. And you know what? I sat in my house because I was petrified with fear. And I, I cowered down from the very thing that has given me the only hope that I've ever known. I want to be able to look them in the face and say, you know what? We lived and we live life to its fullest because he came to give me life and to give me life abundant. What do you want to say? Your children are looking to you in this hour. People who are not sure about their faith, they're, they're teetering on this mandate of salvation or not. Is it real? Is it not? How could a good God allow? Because he's just. And because he knows the end before the beginning starts. And because sometimes I don't understand his ways. He, he tells me that. And quite frankly... I'm not sure the actual origin of this, but maybe, just maybe, we just don't even blame God for this one. Maybe we just thank Him for His provision. You know what I want to say in this season? If I don't say anything else, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren. Maybe somebody one day will go back and watch this. And this is what I will say, that in that great unknown, I just simply leaned in to a holy God. And like John the Beloved, I put my ear upon the chest of God and I heard his heartbeat. His heartbeat that has never changed to tell people about his wonder. That's all I want to do. Not only do we see passage, but secondly, we see that beyond the door, we find sanctuary. The verse continues. It says, we will go in and out, and we will find pasture. That's freedom. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't just bring us in and lock us down? He gives us the benefit of coming in. And going out. That's why I love the prayer. God bless our coming in and bless our going out. God bless this church today for coming in and bless them as they go out. 
Because Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says that when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, you receive power, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and all of Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. And most churches, most people will tell you that when you cross the threshold of this parking lot and enter down Thompson Road, you're entering your Jerusalem. No, your Jerusalem is right here. This is where we live our first witness, here and in our own home to evangelize the people sitting next to us and then to go out and to be a voice of reason. Go in and go out and find pasture. He's citing Psalm chapter 23. The New Testament writers do that so wonderfully. Listen to what it says. You've heard it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Not just pastures. Not just some little place with a spot of grass. This is a lush grove of pastures. But guess what? Sheep will not just lay down anywhere. He lays them down beside the still waters where they can listen and they can hear the roaring lion and the wolf that comes to prey on them that sits outside the door that's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And he says, and he receives Restores my soul. This is what I was talking about two Wednesday nights ago. How do you feel in your soul? That which will live forever. Well, you know, Mark, my back's hurting. No, that's your that's your body. See, we are body, and we're soul, and we're spirit. We call it mind, spirit. You call it with a trichotomy. We're just like God, creating His image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have a body. That if you do not know this, is is already in the process of breaking down. You start to feel things about 40. Little muscles you didn't really even know you had start hurting. You get up and go to the bathroom at 50, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, gosh. (laughs) You didn't work out. You didn't go sprinting. You didn't climb anything. As a reminder of the psalmist's words in Psalm 39, Lord, help me to know my end. Help me to know the brevity of my life and how frail I truly am. But how's your soul? The seed of your own emotions, that which will live forever. How's your soul? Rest for your soul. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here it is. Here's your... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How many of y'all afraid of dogs? How many of y'all afraid of a dog biting you if they're barking at your feet? Okay, let's be real. I ain't afraid of no dog. Let me put a British Mastiff barking at your throat. You'd be afraid. When you read that verse, why don't you just picture the shadow of a dog barking and coming at you. He can't hurt you. You see, the reality is there's a shadow being cast upon death because Jesus says, and we'll look at this probably next week, he says, because I am the light. Shadows aren't present unless there's light overshadowing it. Yea, though to the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. As Keith makes his way back out, because I want to go ahead and get through this, I want you to hear me. Consider the door mentioned in the book of Exodus. You remember it? At the end of all the the, the different plagues came the plague of death. It's where we see the institution of the Passover meal, right? You know it, but maybe you've not seen it. I think we have a picture of how they would do it. They have the the, the lentil, the the, the door header, and then they have the the door post. And they would apply the, look, I'm in that house. (laughs) Do that again. That was super cool, man. Blood of Jesus right there on my head. Y'all see that? (laughs) So the top part is the lintel, the header, the doorpost there that holds the door up. But there's a third part. There's the threshold. It's interesting because 
That's what makes up the casing of the door, that which holds the door, that it may swing in and out and be open, that you may come in and go out. And it's very interesting because he said, take a lamb, slaughter that lamb, take the blood of that lamb, that lamb without blemish, as foreshadowing Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which would take away the sins of the world, and, and paint it upon the lintel and the doorpost. If you connect those two in lines, you'll see a perfect cross. And the Bible says that, that God told him, said, when the death angel passes through and comes through to kill all the firstborn male, guess what? When he sees the blood, he will pass over. And we've said this, and we'll say it again on Good Friday, Lord willing. When we take, when we take communion, it's like painting the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of our own heart. The death angel cannot touch me, he cannot harm me, that I'm already seated in Christ Jesus. I've been bought with a price. I cannot lose what I could have never gained and never purchased. It's by faith and through his marvelous grace. But I say that because as we see the blood on the top part, we may not see what's holding the bottom part and what separates the outside from the inside. It's called the threshold. See, when we have passage into Christ, we find love over the threshold of his door. It's love that covers a multitude of sin. It's love that draws us. It's love that, that put Jesus on the cross. It's love that, that resurrected him. It's love that Jesus says, the way you can know you're my disciples is how you love one another. The greatest of all commandments is love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When I cross the threshold of, of, of God, the, Jesus, the door, I enter into a sweetest love for God. So loved the world that he gave. Also, cross the threshold of mercy. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, he loved us. It's because of love that we cross the threshold of mercy. Listen, when justice called and rings out for all of eternity over your life and over mine, mercy answered the call. Don't ever think that you deserve anything other than death and separation from God just by the inheritance of the fall. But God who is rich in mercy. Thirdly, not only that, guess what? We get grace for by grace are you saved. It's not of yourselves, but the gift of God. When I, when I cross that threshold, I enter into his sweet gift of grace. Crossing the threshold, I get peace, love, joy, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, goodness, self-restraint. Why? Because Galatians 5 and 22 says that's the fruit of the Spirit. Crossing the threshold. Or perhaps today more notable than all of those other things. Watch this. As I cross the threshold into a place of protection. I was told when I came into the ministry nearly 20 years ago, you need a life verse. No pastor can be a good pastor, he said, without a life verse. So I was flipping through it. I found Philippians 4.13. I'm like, man, that's my life verse. God said, no, it ain't. John 3.16, that's, that's a real good one. No, that's not it. Hey, how about Ephesians 2.89? For by grace, are you? that's not it. All right, God, will you just tell me when you want me to have that verse you know what he told me get in my word I don't know why but I started in Psalms that day I started reading God's word in Psalms and I read the book through and through first time I ever did it and he spoke to my heart Psalm 91 and verse 1 he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my strength. As I read that, it's a beautiful picture of what God wanted to tell me throughout the entirety of my life and my ministry. Is Mark, you will only know me and the kind of peace I want you to have is when you go to my hiding place and my presence and you just spend time there. You can't take Stephanie there. You can't take the church there. You don't get to take your grandchildren there. It's just me, and it's just you. And no one else can enter because I've opened the door of safety and protection. And I stopped there. And for years, I didn't see what followed it. 
Several years ago, God brought me to this at a very difficult time in my life. I want to read that to you. Psalm 91, verses 3 through 7, 9 through 11, 14 through 16. For he will rescue you from, the, from every trap and protect you from the deadly disease. Somebody say amen. He will cover you with his feathers like an eagle. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand may fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, those evils will not touch you. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near you or your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in a time of trouble. I will rescue and honor them, and I will reward them with a long life and give them salvation. That's the door. Well, Mark, that's just some mumbo-jumbo. No, that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God. And I believe it, that there is safe passage. They, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of whatever, I will not fear, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You're preparing a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over even in a time of disarray and chaos and confusion. My cup running over today, God, means that I got enough to spill out on others. That's the time of the church. If you're still with me, say hallelujah. I got one more. I promise it. I'm real quick. I'm going to talk fast, so listen fast. If you're going to say amen, it'll make me go quicker. Amen. Where are you going to go? Walmart? <laughs> as much as I just told you, it's still your choice. The third thing I want you to walk away here today is you have to choose the door. You. I know that seems strange. Why wouldn't he just make us? Because God in his sovereignty knows that true love is not love at all if it has no other option. That I get to choose the world. He'll let me. I get to choose lust. He'll let me. I get to choose the, the drug or the thing or the relationship or any other thing. Or I can say no to the world and yes to Him. You have to consider the door that you take. Jesus here saying, I am the door, points to the exclusivity of the only way in. One of the other I am's in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through my door. You see, they would have understood that because gates, doors were common language. We don't think about that. Think about it in the context of a gate. There was an eastern gate that which Jesus will, when he comes back, will, 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 will seat himself, on, put his feet on the Mount of Olives, walk through the Kidron Valley, through the eastern gate, and sit on the throne of his, of his God, and he would declare himself who he is, King of kings and Lord of lords. There was the city gate. There was the sheep gate. And on and on and on and on and on. Gates. They understood it. And listen to me, and I'm almost done. As he's telling this to the Pharisees, one may say, well, why? Why did they need to know this? Because in their mind, hear me, the religious crowd thought they were the gatekeepers to righteousness in God. Because they could quote the Torah. Or because they dress fancy. Or because their dad was. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper. You're not. This church is not. I am not. I am not the shepherd. I am an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ, who he has entrusted to love you and to teach you. But he's the chief shepherd. He told those Pharisees that day something that blows me away. He looked them in the face and he said, everyone that came before me 
They were thieves and they were robbers. You know what he's really saying? You guys are thieves and robbers. Say, so why do I even care about that? Because they understood a sheepfold. They understood a sheepfold. I got a picture of it. I want to show you because I want you to walk away with this illustration. Uh, the, the sheepfold was a big, hasty place where the sheep would find green pasture. That shepherd would have to build that. Let's zoom in a little bit, and I want to show you what I am the door really means because I think we miss it. Keep that up there for just a moment. The lion didn't get into the sheep unless he came through the shepherd. The enemies, the robbers, and the thieves, they didn't come through that door because he was very competent to use that staff that he has. I want you to right now picture your heart as that door and Jesus not standing on his throne in some but rather resting between the posts of your heart you can take it off now that never ever ever lets anything come in that he has not approved of Jesus is the door I don't know if you know this or glean this already but guess what you're the sheep of his pasture sheep if left alone will 100 percent of the time stray you know what else they do they just graze so when they walk they look down and you know what it's been proven that as they're eating because they're worried about their their right now and not the future they're eating do you know if they come to a cliff if they're eating you know what they'll do they're so stupid They'll just walk right off the cliff. Oh, it gets better because sheep are followers. Still talking about y'all, amen? Sheep will follow that front sheep, and there's 12 behind him, and, and, and they're just eating, and maybe one looks up. Did you see what happened to Johnny? Well, okay, let's follow him. One by one. As crazy as that sounds, Dan, that's what we look like to a holy God. We're walking around with our head down, and just following the panic. God says, look up. Look up. For your redemption draweth nigh. I want to close with this. Because there's another door. This is profound to me. Out of all the doors and gates. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Jesus wrote a letter to a church in Laodicea. And he told him, he said, you are lukewarm. I would that you be cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will spew you out of my mouth. That's not the way he talks to the beloved. Say, Mark, but he's talking to a church. Yeah, you're right. Because there are no lukewarm Christians, only lukewarm church members. You're either in or you're out. And then the beautiful, most beautiful picture, Jesus declaring, I am the door. Here's what he does. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Creator of all things is knocking on a door. Mark, where's the door? It's the heart of every person who has the right to open it. Let him cross the threshold into your sinful state and make you new. Let him cross the threshold into your brokenness and just repair you and make you better than you ever were. To cross the threshold of your fear and turn it into the greatest faith you've ever known. To cross the threshold of your death and raise you to life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me and opens the door, I will come into him and he with me and I'll sup with him. I'll have dinner. I'll sit down. I'll rest a while. Communion with the Most High. I want to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. Bow your heads and each person just search in their own heart for just a moment. If you're watching by way of Facebook Live or watching this later, search your heart. 
Bow your head for a moment and close out all distractions. As God stands there today through the finished work of the cross, Jesus stands at your heart's door and he knocks. He will not impress himself upon you. You have to be willing to open the door. Let him in. He'll make all things new. You can sit there today and say, Mark, I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm born again. I have Jesus in my heart. Lift your hand right now. Hold it up high. Hold it up high, unashamedly. In this season more than ever, hold it up high. You can put your hands down. Some hands did not go up. I do not stand today in a seat of judgment. I stand today in a seat of love to say, today is your day. If you're watching online today and you never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, accepted him in his finished work, repented of your sin, and invited him into your heart, today is your day. This is your moment. So if you're not sure today, please, 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 please make today your day. Just pray with me from your heart to God. I'm just a messenger. But this is how I did it, and this is how he saved me. Just pray this. Father in heaven, I have failed you. I am a sinner. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe today that you died for my sin. So I ask you, to forgive me of all my sin, to save me, to be the Lord of my life. I open my heart's door to you today. Come into me and allow me to be with you. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer today, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed it and you meant it, lift your hand right now. God bless you. Hands are going up. God bless you and you. I see hands on this side. God bless you. Praise the Lord. If you're online, send us a private message. Throw up some hands. We'd love to pray with you. Here's what I want you to do while you're right now seated. I'm going to challenge you to do something. There's two connect sides on either side of our church, right and left. We're not going to ask you to come down here in front of us. We're going to ask you to just go to the side. Last week, they were getting in the game. Today, we're just wanting to pray with you. We want to give you a Bible. We want to celebrate with you. And maybe it's a little easier for you to do it over there on the side. If you want prayer today, you can come and just pray at the altar. But if you prayed and you invited Jesus into your heart, hold your hand up again. I saw your hands. I know who you are. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. On the count of three, on the count of three, I want you to get up. And I want you to walk to one of these side places. Don't be afraid. He's not giving you the spirit of fear. He wasn't ashamed of you as he hung on the cross. Don't be ashamed of him now. I promise you it'll change your life. Now more than ever. You ready? No one's looking. But if you prayed and invited him into your heart, here we go. One, two, get ready. Here's your chance. Three, stand up and walk right now. God bless you. Y'all give them a big hand. There's some walking. God bless you. Just come. Just come. Just come. TMJ, if you saw some hands around you, God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Y'all give these folks over here another big hand. Ma'am, if you would, walk right over there. If, if you couldn't make that trek today, every head bowed and every eye closed once more, just raise your hand. We're going to come pr pray for you right where you sit. There's two right over here. Go over there and pray with them. Yeah, right there. Right there, brother. Yep, your, your row, Jay, right there. The rest of you, here's what I want us to do. If you need a touch from heaven, you need a healing in your marriage. Or if you just want to join with everyone else around the nation, as our president today is declared today a national day of prayer. I want you to do something for me. I want you to do something for you and for the Lord. I'm asking every single person that can to get out of their seat and to find somewhere around this room, around the wall, down front. I just want you to move from where you are. That's all. Mark, why are you asking me to do that? The Lord put this on my heart. So I can't really explain it. Maybe you know why. I don't know. But I want you to move. And I want you to find a place somewhere. And I want you to pray for our country. I want you to pray for our leadership. Well, Mark, I don't agree with President Trump. That's okay. The Bible says he's ordained all leaders to be over us. We pray for him. Pray for our local leaders. Pray for our doctors and nurses. Pray for our military, for our first responders. But pray most of all that a God in heaven who is the door to all things would eradicate as quickly as this thing came that it would be gone. And that we will be reminded of who he is.
Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Everyone come. Let's pray. Let's find a place. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the box that you painted yourself in. Find a place somewhere. The back of the room, the front of the room. But don't, don't just leave. This is a moment. This is an important time for you. Thank you so much for joining us today at Northridge Church. We are so thankful that you chose to spend this very special time with us as our extended online family. If you're ever in the area, make plans to attend one of our services in person because we would love to meet you in person. If you have made a decision today to follow Jesus, to make him Lord of your life, or if you have a prayer request or need, please send us a message to the email below. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next time at Northridge Church. God bless.